what would you list as one of the top events in Abraham's life? Would it be his call out of Ur? I mean, God called him originally to journey to a land that Abraham did not know what that was, but would eventually be the land of Canaan? Would it be the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as he stood there and watched fire and brimstone rain down from heaven and wipe those cities and those around them from the face of the earth? Would it be the birth of Isaac, the promised son for whom he had waited so many years and finally he is there? Would it be the sacrifice of Isaac? that promised son that he loved so dearly, but was told to go and to offer him as a sacrifice. You think about the life of Abraham, there are many things you could look at and point to and say, that was a big event in Abraham's life. But there is a record of one event that might be easily overlooked if we only had the Old Testament. And this event is recorded in Genesis chapter 14. So if you want to open your Bibles there, we'll look there in just a moment. But when you read in Genesis chapter 14, you see that this is an interesting part of Abraham's life. And in some perspective, it might be considered minor compared to other occasions. When we read about this, this is the first record of a battle or a war that is taking place. But as we read it, we want to understand that this is an event that plays a deceptively significant role in the Word of God. In Genesis chapter 14, we want to begin by reading verses 1 through 9 as we read about the war of the nine kings. It says, And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, Ketaleomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shimeber, king of Zeboiim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these joined together in the valley of Siddim, that is the salt sea. Twelve years they served Ketaleomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Ketaleomer and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephaim and Ashtaroth, Karnaim, the Zuzim and Ham, the Emim and Sheba Kirathaim, and the Horites in their mountain of Seir, as far as El Param, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat that is, Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hazazon, Tamar. And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboiim, the king of Bela, that is, Zoar, went out to join, and joined together in the battle in the valley of Siddim against Ketaleomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, Am- Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, Four kings against five. So the four against five, the battle or the war of the nine kings, if you will. What we have here is four powerful Mesopotamian rulers waging war. It says there that this is Amraphel and that he is king of Shinar. Shinar was the area in southern Mesopotamia. So if you think of a map of the Middle East, you think about that fertile crescent, On the eastern end of that fertile crescent would be the area of Shinar. Today we know it as Iraq. In Ketaleomer is king of Elam. That was eastern Mesopotamia. And that area today we know as western Iran. So think of Iraq and Iran. Now Ariok, king of Elisar and Tidal, king of nations. We don't know exactly where those territories were, but since they're all in league together there's reason to understand that they are from that same basic area. So they're all Mesopotamian kings. And they come against these five weaker 
Judean rulers, or Jordanian rulers rather, in the Jordan Valley there. And this would be in the southern Jordan Valley where it mentions there, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboiim. If you take a quick peek at Deuteronomy chapter 29, Deuteronomy chapter 29, and in verse 23 there, it reminds us about these cities being those involved in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Deuteronomy 29 and verse 23, it says, The whole land is brimstone, salt, and burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboiim, which the Lord overthrew in His anger and wrath. So those four cities were destroyed and eventually wiped off the face of the earth over in Genesis chapter 19. But Zoar, or as it's also mentioned here, Bela, was spared because that's where Lot begged God to go. And so he went aside to Zoar, and when he entered into Zoar, that's when the fire and brimstone rained down from heaven. So there are these four more powerful kings going against the five weaker kings. And there is the first war that is fought, as it mentions there in verses 3 through 9. The five kings were subdued by the four kings, and they were put in subjection to them. And this is what we would consider an idea of you have a, a subjugated nation or subjugated nations or city-states here who would pay tribute. And it says that they were under their power for 12 years. So they might send them silver and gold. They might send men to fight in their wars. If they were to go off and wage war against someone else, they may send crops or animals, other things like that. But they're under tribute. So the ones in the Jordanian Valley are under tribute to the ones in the Mesopotamian Valley. Now let's take note of this. It says that they serve these kings in verse 4. Or Ketileomer, who is probably the, the more powerful and really the leader of this group, served them for 12 years. Now, if you remember your biblical history back in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham left Haran at 75 years old. If you jump forward to Genesis chapter 16, it says he was 86 when Ishmael was born. So that's an 11 year time period where Genesis 14 falls in the middle of that. So if they were under tribute for 12 years, these events, that initial war took place before Abraham left Haran. So this account here is backing up in time and saying here's what happened before. And then it comes forward to say in the 13th year they rebelled. That's the idea. They quit paying tribute. They weren't cooperating anymore. They thought, we're tired of this. We don't want to be under their thumb anymore. We're finished with that. And it says in the 14th year, then war was renewed. So the four kings from Mesopotamia go over to the Jordan Valley and they are going to be on a mission of revenge, a mission of retaliation, to bring them back under their thumb. So then we get down to verse 10, Genesis 14, verse 10. Let's read through 16 here. Now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, in his goods, and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol, and the brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abraham. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women 
and the people. So as this war is taking place, as this retribution is unfolding by the four powerful kings in the Jordanian Valley there, it says that Lot is captured in battle. It says this takes place in the Valley of Siddim, and that is the Dead Sea area. There's asphalt pits. You have the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah who are there involved in this. And it says in verse 10, they, they are going through this area of asphalt pits, and Sodom and Gomorrah, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, fled. The idea is they're fleeing through these asphalt pits. Maybe they think, well, the enemy can't pursue us real easily through this, however that may be. And it talks about there are others who fled to the mountains. So they are being put to flight. The five kings are being routed by the four kings. And so they're fleeing and they're being scattered. Then in verses 11 and 12, it says that because those armies and their leaders, the kings are being scattered, well then Sodom and Gomorrah are sacked. These four kings go in there, they take the people, they take the provisions, including Lot and all that he had. Well then word comes to Abram. And it says there, this, it comes to him, Abram the Hebrew. Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia, the Bible says that the word Hebrew there really means one from the other side. It's talking about one from the other side of the river, from the other side of the Euphrates River, which it's saying Abram came from Mesopotamia. So he came from the area where these men are there attacking his family attacking Lot and Sodom, Gomorrah, and the others who are there. Well, then Abram decides that he's going to go and rescue Lot. And it says that he gets his 318, in the New King James Version, it says, trained servants. Now, the original word in here, as according to Genesis translation and commentary, means unsheathed. So it's like a sword being unsheathed. And that's why they are called trained servants. Because they're trained in war. They're warriors. They're soldiers. These are not simply Abraham's servants who take care of the sheep and the crops and look after things or around uh, his, where he lives. That's not these guys. These guys, though they may do some of that, these guys are trained in war, They're, they are Abraham's security force, is what they are. He needed protection. He had a lot of goods. Genesis chapter 13 tells us he was rich in silver and gold. So he had a lot he had to protect. So he has these 318 men who it says are his trained servants. And Abraham, or Abram here, unsheathes, if you will, those servants. He cuts them loose and takes them with him to go and attack the enemy. And it says that these men were born in his house. In other words, they're not mercenaries. They were born in his house. He has known them since their birth. So they have a loyalty to Abraham that's beyond just this idea of a normal servant and master relationship. They're closely tied to him. Well, they go and they attack the enemy, and it says that they go north of Damascus. That's a couple of hundred miles at least that they have traveled to go and attack, and it says they attack at night. And the reason they attack at night is because that brings chaos and confusion to the enemy. You know, these are five kings. Think about it. The five kings, or the four kings rather, have come and defeated the five kings. But Abram takes his 318 men and routs those four kings. How could he do that? Well, he did it at night. Surprise attack. Chaos, confusion. You know, we read of accounts like the account of Gideon and how that his 300 men surrounded the Midianites and how they broke the pitchers and they gave the shout and blew the trumpets and all those things were happening and it created confusion in the camp and they began to slaughter each other. Similar type of thing going on here. But Abram's men attack. And of course, Abram has some allies with him as well. Hebrews chapter 7, which we'll get to here in just a little while, 
But Hebrews 7 verse 1 describes this as the slaughter of the kings. The slaughter. So you can just imagine in your mind what's going on here. Abram and his men and their allies go in and they slaughter them. Completely and utterly defeat them. They recover all the captives, they recover all the goods, and they go back. So we go back to Genesis 14. And let's pick up here in verse 17 where Abram is met by two kings when he returns from the battle. It says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Ketileomer and the kings who were with him. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich, except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. So let's look first of all at this king of Salem that came out to meet Abram. It says he came to meet him and he came with the bread and wine. He came with refreshments and he's essentially congratulating him on his victory. You've had a great victory. I've heard about that. Here's some bread and wine for you and for your men. And he gave him a blessing in verses 19 and 20. Now, Kizedek here is the first priest mentioned in the Bible. And he gives a blessing to Abram. And he's mentioned as priest of God Most High. Now, that name God Most High comes from El Elyon. I believe there's a hymn in our books, El Elyon. And that's the description, God above all gods, God over the universe. And then when he blessed Abram, Abram then turns around and gives him a tithe of all that he had captured when he went up and defeated the four kings. In Genesis 14, verse 17, and then again down in verse 21 to 23, it tells us about the king of Sodom then who came out to meet him. And he comes out not to give Abram something, but he wants something. He comes to him and he says, Give me the persons and take the goods. And there are some who see this and say, This is almost confrontational. It's almost like he's just making a demand. You, you give me the per- you keep the goods, but you need to give me the persons back. There's no gift, there's no praise here. And he says, "Give me the people, not the possessions." Well, by the rules of war, Abram really had a right to everything. He had gone, he had fought, he had risked his life, his men had risked their lives, and he really had the right to everything. And here's the king of Sodom saying, you need to give me the people back, but keep the stuff for yourself. But Abram refused to keep anything personally. He says, I have sworn an oath to God. In other words, he's saying, I depend on God. And I'm not going to let it be that you can go around and say, you made me rich. Imagine what that would be like. The king of Sodom. We know what Sodom was like. Genesis chapter 13 tells us it was an exceedingly wicked city. That tells you about the character of the king of Sodom. This is not a good man here. So Abram doesn't want it to be said anywhere, the king of Sodom made me rich. Because he didn't. God made Abram rich. And he trusted in God and he depended on God. Though he did say... The things that my young men have eaten, that's something, you know, we're not, we're going to deduct out of what we've taken here in the spoils of war. And then my allies, let them take what they want. Let them have their portion. But other than that, I'm not taking anything for myself. So let's look at some lessons here because there are several lessons in this account. The first one we want to note is a lesson on poor choices. Lot made some really 
poor choices. He was taken captive here. Remember in Genesis chapter 13, verse 12, when Abram and Lot and their servants were having strife between themselves and Abram had told him, well, you look and, and you pick which way you want to go, I'll go the opposite way. And when Lot looked down on the plain of Sodom, he saw it was well watered. It was a fertile plain. Hey, that's the way I want to go. And Genesis 13, 12 says, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. So he goes down and he's living near Sodom. But in 14, verse 12, when Sodom was sacked by the enemy, he was living in Sodom. So he moved toward Sodom, and then he's living in Sodom. There was wealth there, evidently. There was an advantage in some way, materially, for him to go there. That's why he originally picked it. Oh, that, that's going to be advantageous to me. But there was wickedness, and there was great wickedness in Sodom. You know, the Bible had warned, or the Bible does warn, about being caught up with the wicked. In the book of Proverbs, if you'll notice there, Proverbs chapter 23. In Proverbs 23, notice verses 19 and 20. The wise man says, Hear, my son, and be wise, and guide your heart in the way. Do not mix with my wine bibbers or with gluttonous eaters of meat. Don't mix with them, because there's going to be trouble there. A drunkard and a glutton, verse 21, will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. When people hang out with the wicked, they get caught up in the trouble of the wicked just naturally happens that way. And Lot, since he was living among the wicked, when the enemy came and sacked the city of Sodom, he was taken into captivity. The, we are taken into captivity when we sin. In Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Why do we enter into that sin? Why do we enter into that captivity? Because we made a choice. We made a decision. And it was a bad choice. It was a bad decision. Remember James chapter 1? James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. James 1, verse 13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. You know, we have those desires within us, and then the devil hangs that bait out in front of us. When we take it, we enter into sin, and we're captive then to sin and to Satan because we made a choice to do it. We willed to do it. We weren't forced into it. We weren't helpless. But we made a decision. Just as Lot made a decision to move towards Sodom, to move into Sodom, we make a decision to commit sin. And therefore, we are in captivity. So the Bible gives us the admonitions, the encouragement, that we are not to hang around people who would corrupt us. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil company corrupts good habits or it corrupts good morals. We want to stay away from people who are wicked and sinful and unrighteous, who don't serve God. We want to be around people who are wise, as Proverbs 13, 20 says, because when we walk with wise men, we will be wise. But when we walk with sinners, we're going to have trouble. We're going to be caught up in that trouble. We'll be lured away from the Lord. So there is a lesson about poor choices there's another lesson about redemption. Think about Abram's compassion on Lot. You know, Lot, being his nephew, really should have deferred in all things to Abram. 
When you go back and you read in Genesis chapter 13, when there's a conflict between Abram and Lot, really Lot should have said to his men, cut it out. Just cut it out. We're going to respect Abram. But he didn't do that. And he went the other way. And we understand in God's providence that separated Lot uh, from Abram and things dealing with the heir. But be that as it may, when Abram hears about Lot's capture, he has compassion on him. There's no bitterness. There's no contempt. There's no indifference on his part. He wasn't thinking, well, Lot got what he deserved. He moved down there. He knew what Sodom was like, and he moved into Sodom. He just got what he deserved, tough lot. I'm not going to risk my men, my life, and go up there and get him. He's just got to deal with it now. But he was compassionate toward him. He loved him. He wanted to redeem him, if you will. And that would remind us of God's compassion on us. You know, we make poor choices. As we said in the class hour, you know, Romans chapter 1 tells us exactly what we deserve. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 28 beginning, it says, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to debase mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. I don't know about you, but when I read that list of various sins that men commit as they push God out of their knowledge, as they turn away from Him, things that include the strife and maliciousness and evil-mindedness, a backbiter, boaster, disobedient to parents, I don't know about you, and it says that they're deserving of death, If God exacted that penalty, I never would have made it out of my teenage years, probably my early teenage years. But He's compassionate on us. We're deserving of death. But God does not have bitterness. He does not have contempt. He does not have indifference toward us. But what does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He sent His Son to die for us. What did Jesus say on the cross? First words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's compassion. We deserve death. We deserve what we get. But God is compassionate, kind, loving, forgiving, because... He wants to redeem our souls. Just as Abram wanted to redeem, rescue, if you will, Lot. There's another lesson about faith here. When Abram responded to the king of Sodom and said he had raised his hand in an oath to God, he's saying, I trust in God. I don't trust in men. That's not where my confidence is. That's not where my protection is. That's not how I am sustained. He did not even trust in military conquest. Though he went and he won a great victory, that wasn't the way that Abraham assured his personal protection or his wealth or anything like that. Notice in Genesis 15 verse 1, right after these events that we read about, Genesis 15, 15 verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Instilling more confidence in Abram. I am your shield. You know, we are not to trust in ourselves, as 2 Corinthians chapter 1 talks about. You know, some people 
They trust in themselves. They trust in their own intelligence, their own abilities. They trust in their own efforts. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, it says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength so that we despaired even of life, Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that He will still deliver us. Whatever the circumstances are in life, whatever hardship, whatever danger we may be facing, we need to put our trust in God knowing that He loves us, He cares about us, and that He will be with us. In 1, Corinthians, or rather 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, it says we are not to trust in uncertain riches. You know, that's easy to do in our society. We're a materialistic society. You know, people give the advice, or experts, so-called, give the advice, hey, put back money, you need to um, have your 401k, have your retirement account, and, you know, you'll be financially secured. Well, maybe. Maybe. Stock market may crash. Who knows what's going to happen politically. There have been times in history where economies just completely collapse. You know, what's going to happen one day? I don't mean to scare anybody. What's going to happen one day when, you know, all of our wealth is on a computer somewhere? And a hacker just, boom, it's gone, sorry, tough. Don't know if that's ever going to happen. I'm just saying, we don't know what could happen. We can't trust in uncertain riches. But we have to trust in the living God. That's where our faith needs to be. And so when we face hardships, we face difficulties, we face suffering and sacrifice, our faith isn't shaken. We remain steadfast. And true. Abram remained steadfast and true because his assurance, his faith, his trust was in God. The last thing we want to notice from Genesis 14 is the surety of God's plan. The surety of God's plan. And I'm convinced that's why Genesis 14 is in the book of God. Because when you read there, you know, there are some people say, oh, this is a transition in the Genesis account and it's showing that Abram's this great military leader and he's got this great power and all those kinds of things and they completely miss the point of what's recorded here. When you read the chapter, you think it's just a random, ordinary event because wars happen, right? People fight, there's there's one guy that thinks he's the biggest on the block and he goes and he fights another and says, you're going to pay me now, all those kinds of things. It's, it's not like this was the first time war had ever taken place. It's just the first time it's recorded in the Bible. So you think, well, this is just an incidental thing that happened in the ancient world with no lasting geopolitical impact. There's no empire that's built here. There's no empire that is toppled here. There's no economic or technological advancement. There's no religious awakening in Genesis chapter 14. None of that's happening here. But you get down toward the end and you read about this priest named Melchizedek. But he's just in 18, 19, and 20. He's just in three out of 24 verses as we have the chapter broken up for us. Just three verses. And then what happens with Melchizedek? Nothing for a thousand years. Psalm 110 that we read in the scripture reading. If you'll flip over there with me. Psalm 110 verse 4. David, a thousand years later after this, makes mention of Melchizedek. In Psalm 110 verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek, Genesis 14, he's there, he's gone. He stays gone for a thousand years. Then David 
mentions this obscure thing. You're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. What does that mean? But you get to Hebrews. Hebrews chapters 5 through 7 talk about Melchizedek again. And Hebrews chapter 7 really explains to us, here's what he was all about. Here's the significance of him being in the Bible story. In Hebrews chapter 7, let's read verses 1 through 10 here. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So here's the idea that Abram gave birth to Isaac, or had a son Isaac, who had a son Jacob, who had a son Levi. The Levites, the Levitical tribe, were the ones who were appointed priests. And so Abram, because he was the father of them all, was superior to them. So Abram is superior to Levi. But it says, look, Abram, who's superior, paid a tithe to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek in return blessed him. And all that proves that Melchizedek is greater than, than Abram, which means he's greater, far greater, than Levi. So how do you make sense of all of that when these Hebrews are saying, we need to go back to the old law, we need to return to those old ways? The Hebrew writer here is laying out, no, that's inferior. Because Christ has the priesthood of Melchizedek. He's come in the order of Melchizedek. And you continue on reading down, and you see that he quotes in Psalm 110, or from 110 verse 4, in verse 17, you're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In verse 21, again, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And he proves out the superiority of Christ's priesthood to Levitical priesthood because he is in the order of Melchizedek. In other words, this gives meaning to Genesis 14 and Psalm 110. If you don't have the New Testament, those mean nothing. What, what does that mean? Why? Melchizedek, there is a priest, he brought bread and wine. It's just it's a cute story, but why is it there? See, the Jew can't explain it. Can't explain Psalm 110. What does that mean? A Jew has no explanation for it. But the Hebrew writer says, here's what it's all about. So you think about that. God's hand was guiding the events of the ancient world, as we noted, before Abram left Haran. Think about that. Before he left Haran, there was this providential working of God and bringing these four Mesopotamian kings up against the five Jordanian kings and putting them in subjection. And then there was that rebellion against their subjugation. And then there's another war that takes place. And by that time, Abram and Lot are down in that area and then Lot swept away and taken away. And when he goes and he rescues Lot and he comes back, Melchizedek. He comes out gives him bread and wine, gives him a blessing, receives a tithe, and then disappears from biblical history for a thousand years. You think about that. God was working in all those things, working in people both small and great. 
working in those events to bring about that meeting between Melchizedek and Abram to illustrate the point when you get all the way down to the book of Hebrews, the superiority of Christ's priesthood. See how God was fulfilling His will, how He's working out that plan of salvation and redemption. And that ought to give us confidence in all things that God says. He's working it out, He will work it out, and we can trust in that. If you will, open up to number 291. 291. Abraham stands as a giant in biblical history. He played a key role in the redemption of man, and he had great faith in God and compassion on his fellow man. The account of his rescue of Lot and the meeting with Melchizedek are significant in the Bible story. The same God, El Elyon, God Most High, rules today. We can have full faith and confidence in Him, and as we go out, if you will, and face the battles of our life, and as we seek to rescue others who have been taken captive by the enemy, we can know that God is working. He's working in our lives to bring about redemption, to bring about salvation. And so let us be determined to commit our life to Him today, to trust in Him. If you've never obeyed the gospel, won't you come and confess Jesus is the Christ? Putting your trust in Him turning away from sin, from the unrighteousness in your life. Be determined, I don't want to be captive anymore to sin and to Satan. I want to be free from that. The only way you can be free, putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, turning from your sin, confessing Him as the Savior, and being baptized to have your sins washed away. And if you're a child of God and you've wavered, that your commitment to the Lord, your trust in Him, is not what it should be. And you recognize this morning, I'm caught up in sin, I am captive once again, but I don't want to be here. I don't want to be this way. I don't want to live this way. I want to have fellowship with God. I want to have a home in heaven. I want to live with Christ. Then won't you repent of that sin that is in your life that's keeping you from a relationship with God? Won't you confess it? If it's something you need to confess publicly, come forward and confess it this morning. And the good brethren here will pray with you, they'll pray for you, that you may be restored. So if you need to respond to the invitation, we invite you to come forward while we stand and sing.